This is Six Tackles with Gus with Matthew Thompson and Gus Gould. Welcome to Six Tackles for another week. So much to get through. Plenty of exciting content coming your way for another Wednesday. On the menu, the Rabbits rebuild has started with a new assistant coach confirmed just this morning. Joey Manu to say sayonara to the Roosters. Boom tish. As Gus says, it's never too early to talk origin. That's what you say, isn't it? No. The series launched in Melbourne yesterday. We'll, uh, we'll venture into origin territory. Plenty of Ask Us questions in round seven. Well, round six show that, again, it's uh, very unpredictable at the moment. Welcome. Matthew Thompson, how are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> That's right. I got that wrong, didn't I? Well, we're not talking origin today, are yeah. we? Why? Well, they launched the series yesterday. Did they? They did. They launched it in Melbourne and... You would know that you coached the first ever Origin game played at the MCG. I did. Yeah, I remember that distinctly. 1994. Mm. New South Wales 14, Queensland nil in front of 87,161 fans. Yeah, it was incredible. 87,000. So that, that it was a bit of a novelty, I suppose, at first. But Melbourne, it's become a regular stop on the, the Origin um, journey. The year after 95, that was... That was Fatty series, wasn't it? Twenty points to twelve, and that game, that game featured. That was a massive blue at the start of that game, wasn't there? Yeah, there was a little bit of an altercation. It wasn't. They weren't the first games in Melbourne, though. I went to an Origin game down at Olympic Park. Um, yes, very early on. I think Brad Fittler made his debut in a game there. It was a game where Ricky Stewart took an intercept, and they won down there. But I remember we went down to launch that series in Melbourne and had a good look around. Looked at the MCG, and I said to our manager, T, Jeff Carr, I said. Whoever wins this game will win the series. And it was the middle game. Mm -hmm. And we lost the first game in Sydney. Um, it was, it was the Mark, Mark mm. Coyne miracle try in the corner in the last minute. So we had to go to Melbourne to win. We didn't turn it into a great spectacle. We kind of blotted them out. We beat them 14-0, but it was a must-win game for us. Uh, I remember they had a coach's box for us up where the AFL coaches sit. Uh, up in the grandstand. It was so far away, we went and sat on the sideline. That'd be I no said, use not, to you. I said, I'm not coming to the Melbourne Cricket Ground to sit in a coach's box. So we went and sat on the sideline. It was wonderful. The noise was incredible. So you'd have never seen a crowd like that in a game you'd been involved in before? No, never, never. No, yeah. I, I, I've topped crowds here with like 40,000 at yeah. the Sydney Football Stadium or something like that. I think I might have played, I can't remember the crowd in the 81 grand final. might have been 50-odd thousand at Sydney Cricket Ground uh, when Newdown played in 81. Um, but they were... Sort of the biggest crowds that I'd I'd seen, but um, yeah, eighty seven thousand. It was phenomenal. It was a great night, and uh, uh, we got the money. We went on to Brisbane to win in game three. So we we lost the first game of the series, but won a decider in Queensland, first New South Wales side ever to do it. Um, there's this funny story about launching the game down in Melbourne. They <laughs> Tom Radonikus coached the Origin team one year, and uh, um, they had to go down and launch, do the launch up in the long room in Melbourne. Yeah, you know, very very official. It's all all great. And um, they had to get Tommy out of bed the next morning because the boys had had a bit of a bonding session the night before. <laughs> Tommy couldn't find his teeth. Oh, oh really? <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't find his teeth. Oh. So Tommy had to go to Melbourne when he got down there. He had no socks and no teeth. Uh, he went without them. He went without them. <laughs> I love him. Some people lose their phones. Some what? people lose their keys. <laughs> Tommy lost his teeth. Couldn't find his teeth. What a champion. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> and he killed him. So Gus, Gus's Blues won the first game at the MCG. How, um, I mean, now players are used to this, but how new was it to your team back in 94 playing on a big, round surface like that? Even though this field is the same, you, it's 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 very different vista oh, playing in the game. Oh, incredibly, incredibly um, different. Uh, and the surface was different because it was prepared for AFL. It had a lot of bounce in it. It was quite hard for a football field and it was a ground with a cricket ground and there was a cricket pitch in the middle. Um, you know, we'd experienced that here in Sydney, my time as a player, playing at the SCG every now and then. Match of the day, or all finals were played at the SCG, which was a big oval and uh, a cricket pitch in the middle. North Sydney Oval was a bit like that. Lidcombe Oval was a bit like that. So... We kind of experienced it growing up, but uh, as stadiums become more rectangular and more you know, you know, user-friendly, players very rarely these days get to play on the big expansive ovals. They do it well because they put the advertising bollards and mm. you know, screens and everything up the side, so you kind of get a bearing, but um, you know, it's not easy the first time. And We certainly found it difficult down there in Melbourne that night. We played a fairly conservative sort of game. 
and um, and we got the money. But we, we had to win to keep the series alive. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what the coaches had to say later, but just quickly here. The, the series order is Sydney, MCG middle game, Suncorp third. I'll say it again. Whoever wins in Melbourne will win the series. So if New South Wales win game one, they'll wrap it up in Melbourne. If New South Wales lose game one, they're going to have to win in Melbourne and then win in Brisbane. But I think whoever wins in Brisbane in Melbourne will win. That's how important it'll be. Mm. The other one, the other, they'll be wanting to win their home game, but you've got to win that Melbourne game. Whoever yeah. wins Melbourne wins the series. Want to win in two New South Wales, having the first game at home. Yeah, I don't want to be going to Brisbane for either side. No. All the action of origin. Not far away. It's about six. It's about, so Billy Slater said yesterday, six games until they pick the first teams. Um, don't pick your teams too early. Know. But never too early to talk origin. Um, all the action exclusively live tonight. In men's and women's, we are the, the destination for origin football. Round six, most impressive team, Phil Gould. There was a lot of close ones, wasn't there? A lot of close games. Um, I was impressed with Manly. I really expected the Warriors to win that game over there, and I thought Manly did a great job to get to the front by the margin they did. Warriors showed their class and came back, um, and were extremely lucky. They shouldn't have got that last penalty. That was ridiculous, and Manly should have won 20-18. to 18. As it was, they escaped with a point, uh, draw after an extra point, but I thought Manly were very, very impressive. Um, I thought Titans were impressive, even though they lost. I, I was really pleased with the improvement in their defensive, albeit you know they tested the referee a fair bit along the way. Um, Roosters, you know, we tipped them here last week as the outsiders against Newcastle, and they were able to go to Newcastle and get the money up there. So um, you know, there were some good performances on the weekend. Who's the best player? Bear in mind, Joey Marnie broke the record for running meters. Yeah, well, Joey was great. Um, yeah, and I, I think last week I said I'm. I'm liking Roosters because Joey Manu's at fullback. That's nothing against James Tedesco, but I just – Joey Manu goes to another level when he plays in that position, and, and he plays the perfect sort of upset football. Like, he's he's unpredictable. He's constantly at you. He's, you know, yeah. if, you, if you're showing any sort of weakness there, he can find it out. And I really fancied the fact that he'd gone to fullback and that Roosters were underdogs in that game, that, that, that they could get the money, and they did narrowly. Uh, Knights were very, very good. In fact – in the first 15 minutes, I thought Knights were going to win comfortably. I thought, geez whiz, I've got this wrong. Knights were outstanding. The injury to Ponga, I think, pulled them up a little bit at different stages and that allowed the Roosters to get back into it. And then they were dominant for a while. And then that sort of stopped. And Newcastle, it's a weird game. Newcastle came back at the end. But they were, all the games were kind of like that on the weekend. Um, Dragons. Dragons accommodated for Tigers comfortably. I thought the Tigers got a little bit of stage fright. Um, there's a, a train of thought that when these lower teams are favourites and playing in front of big home crowds, it puts a lot of pressure on them, the pressure of expectation. Still a young side, the Tigers. And I, I, that's, I think they'll be disappointed they didn't put their best foot forward. 90% of the games they play in, they're underdogs, mm. and that suits them perfectly. But favourites at home in front of that big crowd at Campbelltown, um, they just bumbled and fumbled their way a little bit. And Dragons are the sort of team that will bring that out in you because they just – they play that very spoiling sort of game, and um, and Dragons won comfortably. All the other games were all pretty close. Yeah, they were. Tigers were doomed when I declared them certain is on this podcast last week. Did um, you? Yeah, who, I did. Who did I tip? Dragon. Thank you. Um, just just lastly before we move on, and I don't. I'm not trying to be provocative with this question. If if you're if you're coaching against the Roosters, are they a more dangerous team with Manu at fullback than Tedesco? Uh, there's a there's a more unpredictable edge with them. With Manu at fullback, yeah, look, they're still they're, they're still dangerous with Tedesco at fullback, but you don't see the best of Manu when he's playing in the centres. You mm. see the best of Manu when he's playing at fullback, and it's it's quite different. Roosters, I've said this many many times um, over the years. Roosters score tries that other teams just don't score. Like that that you'll sometimes see them beat someone by forty, and I'll say, yeah, but it's the Roosters. They scored a lot of tries in that game that you won't score. Uh, so don't think that. The other team was really poor. The Roosters just score tries out of nowhere sometimes, and they've got a very unique uh, way about them. Um, they're kind of predictable, but then at the end of it, they're not predictable. It's a, it's a, and it comes from years of a lot of those combinations playing together and some very uh, explosive players. And um, yeah, but Joey Manu playing at fullback is a handful for anyone. I'm absolutely devastated he's leaving the game. I, I, I just. Yeah. 
I'm devastated that he's leaving the game. Tell me this. Is Japanese rugby played at the same time of year as our rugby league? I think it's played in the summer, isn't it? Uh, I think it is summer, yeah. Yeah. He'll, be, think he'll be back, I'm predicting. Yeah. This might be an in-betweener. A very lucrative one. Yeah. Well, bucks. yeah well, good luck to him. Do you but, know, what, you know yeah. I, I, it's, it's a tragedy that he's going to another code. It would be. And Trent Robertson's a great coach, obviously. If you had, if you had a Manu in your team, Think back to like put your coaching hat on. Could you find a way to just to break the mold rather than playing him as a centre? Like just to say, right, uh, you are a ball follower. Like don't, I don't want you. Out, I don't want you to stand out in that right hand edge. I want you to get just get just follow everything. Well, I, I've said if I was coaching him and I had a Tedesco in the team, I would play Joey at six, but I'd play him as a second f- fullback. Yeah, yeah, you know, with the likes of Victor Radley and a Kiri and a Sam Walker or what have you. You've just got to mix your team up a little bit. I mean, positions are so interchangeable these days. You shouldn't think of them in the normal positions that we have. And in fact, coaches don't talk about halves and five eights and lock forwards and back rowers. They don't. They don't use that sort of language. It's um, so. My thought is like, I don't say that Joey Manu is a five eight. He's not a five eight at all in the traditional sense. But closer to the action, playing as a second fullback, mm. uh, I think he could be dynamic. Yeah, you know and. Um, you know, with the fellow, with likes of Billy Smith and Suali'i playing in the centres, they've obviously got plenty of depth in those positions. My my only thought with Manu at six was to get him close to the ball. The problem is when they played him at six, they tried to get him to play like a traditional six, and he's not like that. He's not even a traditional fullback. He's not like that. So that would be my thought. But I'm not telling the Roosters how to suck eggs at all. But that was always my thought with Joey Manu to get him closer to the action, but allow him a freelance role a freedom role, have the game management down to your nine, your seven, your 13, maybe even a ball-playing back rower, and have Tedesco and, and Manu in, in a roving commission. Mm. Tedesco probably doing the traditional fullback role, and Joey Manu just, Joey, whenever you feel invited, you come along and play. And whenever Joey wants the ball, give him the ball. Simple as that. That's just how he's that sort of player. Now, Gus has told us all about how back in the day he'd sit on the hill to spy on teams and like Brian Smith and Tim Sheens and all those blokes would be there with a beer. Scouting. Scouting. Yeah. He didn't have a blue with them after too many beers on the hill, did you? No, I never had any blues. Because my question is, we need more coaching feuds in the NRL. (laughs) 100% we do. Yeah, it's good. Mutual acceptance society. They all get there and give each other a rap and talk about how good they are and they go to meetings together and... I couldn't do that. I couldn't sit in a room with other coaches and discuss the rules. Of the, I wouldn't want to do that. How good's Ricky? I love it. He just does not care. Oh, Ricky. <laughs> He's the best. Rick, Ricky hates everyone. <laughs> Ricky hates human beings. <laughs> Rick, Ricky's the best grudge so holder. so funny. Ricky's the best grudge holder of all time. I sent him a text after the press <laughs> conference the other night and I said, what did he say? Another planet. I yeah, said, he don't know planet. He's on another planet, just in quotes, you know. <laughs> and he come back with a I, I laughing emojis. He come back with a response I can't repeat on oh, air. But he's still going. He's still going. <laughs> he was still going. He was still oh, going. God, I love he him. He was into him. Yeah. And Desi. Desi's one of the old-time greats too. But Desi, Desi would have been winding them all up. Desi's trying to get a win. Yeah. You know, he needs a win next week. He's playing his old club next week. No one sort of saw that. I, I said that on 100% 40 Monday night. That game was gone. Des wasn't worried about that gone. Des was worried about next week's game. Don't worry about that. Putting some pressure on the referee and trying to get some rub of the green. Um, There's no doubt in that game the Titans went out there to test the referee and to uh, improve their defence by, you know, really pushing the envelope. And they they gave away a lot of penalties and they were prepared to give away a lot more and they could have been penalised a lot more. But the tactics work. They worked. They got themselves back into the game. They got to golden point and just couldn't kick the field goal. So... Ricky and Dez apparently had a few words face to face after the game. Was it common back in your day to have a few words face to face with an opposition coach? Uh, I remember the first time you and Bozo ran down to the tunnel to try and get at the ref at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "You go first. <laughs> I want to know what you say." <laughs> he just laughed at me. Yeah, no, no, I don't think we ever had. I don't think I've ever had words with an opposition coach. So yeah, the game's never ended. But we had, we had walking up the tunnel and you have not having. No. Mouthed off at each other. No, 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 no. Nothing like that. But there was always great rivalry. There yeah. was always, you know, like I say, like in those days, before videos of games and all the technology they have now, to scout your opposition team, you had to go to games. You had to go. So on your day off, you'd go to – I went to games every time. My team wasn't playing. I'd go to as many live games as I could. 
So when I went to play against the team, you know, this Sunday, I'd already seen them three or four times live, watched their video, you know, gone back and looked for the things that I wanted to see and I preferred to watch it live. But when I went to the football, you know, the dedicated coaches would be around. You'd see them there, you know. Were they dressed, were they dressed in disguise? No. <laughs> <laughs> like a Groucho Marx outfit no, no, or something. No, no, no. I'd love to see that Brian Smith with a fake pair no, that, of glasses in no, a moustache. You, yeah, you're in a disguise on training nights. When you, <laughs> when you had to someone send someone to their training venue to find out who, oh, who was playing. Oh, you used to do that. I had the spy. Spies? Of course you did. It, who was your spy? Did you have Jimmy Jones your spy? <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my spy is deceived so I can say what I like. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Who was it? No, just a mate of mine. Yeah. Yeah. And what would he look for? No. What would he be looking at? Like how they line he'd, up? He'd, and... he'd buy a jersey in the opposition team's colours and take his daughter <laughs> take, his, take his daughter along and walk his dog. Oh, that's the best ever. <laughs> <laughs> did you used to see people people like lob up at Penrith Park on a Tuesday night that you knew oh, spies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in, in one series, the series that we won the comp in 91, um, I had them training at an army base out the back of uh, Northern Road there because I was – I was sure Tim Sheens was spying on us. Like Tim Sheens had contacts in Penrith everywhere, <laughs> you know. But you, you had, and that, I mean, media wasn't like what it was back then, and information wasn't like it was back then, and injuries they weren't covered like they were back then. So you weren't getting information about that. So you, you know, and it was mainly not to see what they were doing. It was more to see who was playing. Yeah. Or if you didn't know a left centre or a right centre were going to swap sides or whether or not their halfback was playing or whatever. You just wanted to know what the team was going to be more than anything. Um, but you had to find it. You had to find out. That's so funny. Yeah. So there were, there were actually, there were blokes walking around that you knew were spies. They had to find out. Wayne, <laughs> Warren Ryan, when we used to train at Belmore, I was playing, when we used to train yeah. at Belmore, he was petrified about Jack Gibson. He was petrified <laughs> that Jack Gibson was a spy. You know how Belmore's near the train, the yeah. train line there? Yeah. Every time the train went past, he'd stop training. <laughs> He stopped training. Peter Tunks would say, I think I saw Ron Massey on the train. And Warren was the most paranoid black in the world. So, so stop. And stop when the train goes past. He was petrified of everyone. When we were at Henson Park, when we were coaching New Down, there used to be an old black who used to walk his dog at Henson Park every day of the week. Now, old black, he lived up in the street up behind the thing. He was about as much a spy as I was an astronaut. Warren kicked him out one night. We said, you can't kick him out. He walks his dog here every night. I'm not sure he will know Jack Gibson. He'll know. (laughs) I do remember. Paranoia. Absolute paranoia. I remember a few origins when there would be people sort of, they managed to get themselves in the stand somewhere and they'd be hidden up the top and they'd stop training and kick them out. Yeah. You know, just they'll just sit there watching. But It was like when you used to take your greyhound for a private trial. You know, like we used yeah, to happen. we used to great. Yeah, you go out to Richmond, you know, and you, you have a private trial, you know. But there'd be some bloke up in the up in the grandstand with a broom pushing the broom, and, <laughs> with a stop watching his hand. As <laughs> yeah. so, soon as they open the boxes, he go click. <laughs> Wouldn't move. Wait till they got to the finish. Click, and then he goes sweeping. <laughs> he goes sweeping the broom. Oh, private too trial. Funny. Yeah. Oh, that's At least funny. take your price. Jai Gray will remain at fullback for the rest of the year. No, 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 no. It's a hard one. It's a hard one. I suppose he's only had one game, hasn't he? He has. Um, I've got – look, Latrell will come back as the fullback. There's no, there's no risk about that. And you, 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 I've heard what people say, maybe he's a better centre. Well, then what are you going to do with a Jack White? And, but, you know, if you play Latrell in the centres in club football, you're not going to get everything you want out of him. Um, you know, maybe Jai Gray's the future – and he's certainly shown his potential in the lower grades and it was, it was a, a nice performance the other night. But I've got no doubt the will come back as their fullback and he'll come back with plenty to prove. Um, but, you know, the young bloke showed his potential and he's got a long career in front of him. I, I said to you the other day, these, these playmakers, whether you're a hooker, a fullback, a half or a 5'8", don't get too carried away when they're young because their career, I reckon, starts at 24-25. I reckon your career's from 34-35. 24-25 to 34-35. That's going to be the highlight of your career. So Jai's got – it's a long race. There's a long way to go. Don't thrust too much expectation on him at the moment. The trial might come back at 5-8. What are you going to do with Cody? Halfback. No, it doesn't work. The trial might go to centre and white in 5-8. What are you going to do with Cody? Halfback. No, it doesn't work. Cody halfback doesn't work full stop. No. Okay. Cody's right where Cody is. All right. 
Jack Whiten's right where Jack is. The only move I'd move with Jack, I might put him into the forwards mm. uh, rather than the centres, but Latrell will be the fullback. Now, in time down the track, you never know. The importance of assistant coaches is undersold. Absolutely. In, 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 and I, I learned the future of coaching many, many years ago um, when I was at the Panthers back in the early 90s and um, they very kindly took me on a trip to America. There was uh, Roger Cowan, the former boss of the Leeds Club, the Panthers group, and Don Feltus was the CEO of the football club and we, he and the three of us took a trip to America. We went to UCLA College. We went to uh, the Phoenix Suns basketball. We went to the LA Rams. And we went to the San Francisco 49ers, which was one of the leading franchises in the world. And one of the things that really struck me was the size and extent of their coaching staff. The head coaches in those, er- in those, in those areas, even at the college level, had um, anything up to 20 assistant coaches. The, the, the head coach was... 20? A, yeah, it, it was a phenomenal. Positional coaches, individual coaches, um, attack coaches, defence coaches, you know, special teams coaches, kicking coaches. Like there was that much individual coaching of these people and the head coach virtually managed it. And what the head coach was saying, the head coach in those days was kind of like a football manager, like a CEO. And the coaches were the ones that were close to the players. They were the ones that were doing it. Now, mm. you're talking about America with giant budgets and, and professional and different, you know, it's... It's a football code, but it's a different sort of code to ours. But it came back and gave me a lot of idea about individual coaching. And I used to, you know, mainly on an honorary basis, ex-players, blokes I'd coach, blokes I'd play with, you know, could come and spare a couple of nights a week to come along and coach your wingers, coach your fullback, coach your front rowers. And we see a lot of that more now these days, and they're more in specialist roles. And um, every head coach has probably got three, maybe three specialist assistant coaches and then other you know, kicking coaches and, you know, other coaches that you have. In our academy, um, what we had at the Panthers and the Bulldogs, you know, we had specific coaches for specific roles and age groups and et cetera, et cetera. Assistant coaches are the ones that are doing most of the coaching, most of the coaching. Yeah, okay. Um, hands-on coaching. The head coach um, delegates and manages a lot more of that. Now, some of the coaches are more – some of the head coaches are more hands-on than others. Some specialise in attack. Some specialise in defence. Some are more specialised in uh, developing um, you know, the mental side of the game and uh, the physical side of the game. So they've, they've all got their specialties, but um, there is more and more delegation. Job creation within our game over the last 10 years, 12 years has exploded incredibly. I would say it's only been, even though we've been full-time ever since pay TV money came into the game back in the 90s, I don't think our game has really come to terms with full-time professionalism until, you know, the last decade, probably the last eight or ten years, and uh, in that time there's been a, a hell of a lot of job creation um, and specialist job creation, and it's neat. And it, it's helped the players, it's helped the standard of the game, and it's helped development, it's created employment for other people. Um, your question was? The value or the importance of an assistant is undersold. They're undersold, and they're getting good money now. They're getting good money. Uh, and the reason I asked it is because perhaps South Sydney and Jason Demetriou underestimated the importance of an experienced assistant because the club has sought to rectify that today. They've announced David Ferner is back at the Rabbits as an assistant and he will take over the role as the primary defensive coach. So he joins a team that consists of, uh, obviously, Demetriou's head coach, Ben Hornby, Joe O'Callaghan and uh, John Sutton. Um and we know David Ferner, he's been previously part of the Rabbitohs coaching staff, but also he worked alongside Jason Dimitri uh, at the Cowboys. They were assistant coaches when they won the comp all the way back in 2015. So, um, And David's also been a head coach. He has. <clears throat> he's also been a head coach, probably before his time, but he, he was a head coach. You know, he's got the scars to show it and has now made a career for himself as an assistant coach. Um, you look at, you know, it's a great example. You look at a, a prominent uh, head coach like a Wayne Bennett, um, and look at the people that took over clubs after him and how they've struggled with that. They were, good, they were great assistant coaches. They've taken over, you know, a Wayne Bennett coach club and have struggled with it, but have gone on to be great assistant coaches elsewhere as well. Um, it's an know, interesting it, one, the Bennett one, isn't it? Like, it's, it, you, look at the, well, you look the, at the track record. Yeah, well, there's no personality like Bennett and there's no one with that sort of gravitas and that sort of aura about him and he does it in his own way. Um, I don't know that he's a coach of coaches or... 
he may have done later in his career, but that's sort of was never hit really his priority. Um, but it would be a hard task to take over. It's like whoever eventually takes over from Craig Bellamy at Melbourne. You'd rather be the coach that follows the coach that follows the legend, and that's an old saying, you know. So it's going to be a very hard task to take over from long-term, you know, successful coaches like that, and some need just to find their feet with it. And it's, you, your appointment of your assistant coaches is vitally important, vitally yeah. important. So, um, but I remember saying to those two boys, you know, your, your, your biggest decision is going to be who's going to be, you know, everything you've done as assistant coach, you're going to have to let a lot of that go. All right, and you're going to have to find someone who becomes your closest ally and you're an extension of you and your thoughts. Um, and you're going to have to trust them to have their own thoughts and have their own theories on the game um, and how they sit down. And so, you know, the coaches will come in defensively or offensively and present to the head coach and he'll say, yeah, I like that, I don't like that or whatever they do. You know, I don't know, I'm not close to coaching anymore, but um, we didn't have assistant coaches when I coached. No. Used to write the used to write the the, the teams on the blackboard. Walk in a tree. <laughs> That's such a throwback, isn't it? Yeah. First grade, second well, grade, it's like, it's like President's team, Cup. Team announcements. When I first started, like back in the old days, you know, they used to you'd walk in on Tuesday night and they'd have the three teams up on the board. You'd have to look and see which team you're in. <laughs> isn't it great? Under twenty three reserve grade first oh, reserve grade this week. All right, and off I go. Yeah, some famous stories about that. Is it? Yeah, that's how you'd find out. And yeah, you didn't grumble about it, you just went to the coach. Just you know, no one whinged about it. You didn't have nowadays, Craig. You got managers and so, so. So you'd look you'd look at the board, and you would see where you picked, yeah. and then you just go and you just go and walk over to the coach that corresponds with the team. Yeah, go over to the coach. <laughs> G'day, mate. <laughs> Haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we had a reserve grade coach at Penrith once. Um, <laughs> a funny fella, and uh, anyway. The head coach dropped Bob O'Reilly. Remember Bob O'Reilly? And Bob O'Reilly was one of the big purchases for Panthers, you know, at the time. Anyway, Bob Bob was having a run of out, so he sent him back to reserve grade, you know. And uh, so he come back down, we're all standing in a circle, and Bob O'Reilly walks over. Going, oh, crikey. And I'm like, I'm only 18, you know. And um, so he gets there and he says, he says to Bob in front of the team, he said, well, Bob, he said, you dropped. He said, you're down here with me now. He said, now... You're a mistake factor. He said, I don't want you passing the ball. <laughs> and that was Bob's game. Bob was a ball distributor enough for that. He said, I don't want you passing the ball. He said, uh, and he said, you're not going to make them mistakes in my team, you know. So I went home and I said to my dad, I said, I can't believe what the coach said to Bob O'Reilly. He said, well, I said, we told Bob O'Reilly. He said, you know, you can't pass the ball. I said, Bob O'Reilly's an international. He's not going to let him pass the ball. He said, well, you go and tell Bob O'Reilly if he wants to pass it, you'll be backing him up. <laughs> I scored three tries. <laughs> yeah, I, went to Bob be- I went to Bob before the game. I said, my dad said that I should back you up all day. <laughs> and he said, on your sonny, you, you follow me. <laughs> big Bob set me up for three tries. They were the days. The big ball playing, ball playing front rower. He was a good one. He was the funniest man I ever knew. Funniest man I ever knew. Good I, bloke. My highlight of the week was as a kid. <laughs> Was was getting to training early to play touch football with the first graders because that was your education, yeah. And I had some great players there back in those days, like your, your English internationals, Mike Stevenson, Bill Ashes, Dave Topless, Bob O'Reilly, Ken Wilson. I mean, it was just wonderful to go and be with. Them. But then after training, to go to the pub and sit and listen to their stories. And Bob would have a few beers and he'd start taking off Bugs Bunny commercials. <laughs> and he'd be giving everyone nicknames and playing cards, and he was a card. Yeah, funny, funny man. Yeah, I played. I played against him in a reserve grade game at Henson Park one day. He got dropped. We were playing Parramatta, and I was playing reserve grade for New Down. He was playing reserve grade for Parramatta. Anyway, anyway, uh, I got. I, I jumped on a loose ball, and then out of nowhere, Bob comes and flops on me. <laughs> just, just, just landed on me, and I went, "Oh!" He said, "Sorry about the flop." He said, "Jack counts him as tackles." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Jack counts him as tackles. That's very good. Oh, classic. Classic. Um, you mentioned your, uh, well, disappointment, I suppose, that Joey Manu is going to go and play with, uh, they br- brilliantly name these Japanese rugby teams, don't they? Toyota Verblitz. Well, they're all um, companies. Yeah, they're all they're all sponsors. As I understand it, they're yeah. all companies. Toyota Verblitz, they sound like a fast team. Um, one person who isn't disappointed is Steve Hansen, the All Blacks coach, Gus. Mm-hmm. He's quoted in the Sydney Morning Herald today saying that when he heard of the uh, the potential code switch, he said he couldn't say yes quick enough. Yeah. Um, just as he helped transform 
How long has he signed for? I think it's. I don't actually know. It's a million dollars a season. So I'm. I'll I'll have a look. Uh, Anyway, so obviously Steve Hansen was the one that transformed Sonny Bill Williams into a dual international, and he went on to win a World Cup. And he says he can see the exact same attributes in Joey Manu as he can as Sonny Bill. So I'm wondering. I mean, clearly he's got the ability to become an all-black and, and become a dual international. I wonder if he gets the all-black bug. We might not see him back. I think he'll be back. I think this is an in-betweener. Signing a year-long deal with Japanese rugby team. Okay, so it's only a year. One year? Right. He'll be back. He'll be back. Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> he'll be back. Uh, yes, yeah, so he's going to leave the tricolours at the end of the year um, and then the, the Wallaby... Um, and the Waker Tagawazi. Go and earn some money, then come back and play. He's going to come in and replace Rooskers. him. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, so maybe. More than one way to skin a cat. Well, it, yeah, well, depending on what happens, I mean, he might not get the chance to play for the All Blacks, but we'll, we'll wait and see. But he, he absolutely has the talent to do so, should he want. Uh, all right, so ask Gus questions. Gus, do you think the Dragon should be planning for life after Ben Hunt? He's 34, uh, and the club wants to re sign him. Are there any good halves out there that you could take a look at? Um, potentially as a successor, asked Jesse. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. I think we've spoken about this subject a number of times. Um, you know, lack of investment in development, um, the coaching at junior rep level, uh, COVID and lack of development uh, during that time uh, has left us with obviously a shortage of players in these positions at all levels, at the NRL levels. What I'm seeing is the emergences of a lot of really strong junior rep teams. Now, I think the junior rep teams this year, certainly here in Sydney, are the strongest I've seen them for a number of years, which is good. Um, and there are some really good halves prospects there. But when you're talking about 17, 18, 19-year-old kids, they're still a ways away from being regular NRL players. And then once you get them to the NRL, they're still a ways away from being regular winners and, and game managers. So... There's a long way to go in those. And we've expressed a number of times how most of our top playmakers in the game uh, are well into their 30s and approaching retirement. Uh, We keep moving the goalposts, though, with that. You know, back in my day, when you were getting to 30 years of age, they were starting to look for your replacement then. Mm. Nowadays, you're just coming into your sweet spot. And the likes of Daly Cherry Evans, who's now, what, 36? Daly Cherry Evans? I think he's 35. 35, maybe 36 if he goes around again next year, which I believe he will. Um, you know, that's extraordinary. And that was brought on by your Thurstons and your Cronks and your Cameron Smiths who played for all that amount of time as well. And, um, you know, they've, it's given everyone with sports science the way it is and the training way it is, you keep them going, you keep them going later. Now, any club with any sort of, they know that they've got to be preparing for life after their major playmaker, whether, it doesn't matter how old he is, because if he's missing, as Mitchell Moses is with Parramatta, um, or as a, you know, even Penrith are prepared for what they do when Nathan Cleary's not going to play Origin when he's playing Origin or he's out injured. You've got to, you've got to have backup, but long term, uh, yeah. Is there any kids in the Dragon system there in the halves? They've got some good kids, haven't they? Yeah, they have. Yeah, they have. They, they've got two sets of. Let's see, the Dragons have got the Steelers and they've got St George Dragons, so they actually have two sets of representative teams. Yeah. And in the seventeens and nineteens, they did pretty well in both. Um, uh, and there's some some nice young players there, but they're they're a long way away from taking over from Ben Hunt. Yeah, you know, long way away from taking over from Ben Hunt. Um, yeah, that's uh, and that's not easy to replace. Mm. Yeah, they got plenty of money, but finding the actual resources on the market to be able to purchase is another matter. And that's why they get the big bucks because if one happens to come off the market on the market, they they've got the bargaining power. It's just supply and demand. It's the same with front rowers at the moment. This is a good question from David, who I'm assuming is an Englishman, maybe even listening to us in the UK. Why hasn't the NRL or NRL clubs appointed an English coach in almost 30 years? They appoint returning Australian coaches who've served in the Super League, but never a UK head coach. How come? Many would appear good enough. Yeah, a few of them come out as assistant coaches. A few of them have come out here and spent some time as assistant coaches. Not so much as head coach. Steve McNamara has been here. Steve McNamara has been here. There's uh, one over in New Zealand at the moment. Um, yeah, there have there have been English coaches out here. Oh, who's up in Newcastle? Um, um, yeah. Anyway, oh. name escapes me. Yeah. But th- there have been a few that have come out and and tried their luck as assistant coaches. Um, 
As for an Englishman to come out as a head coach, the last one I remember was Malcolm Reilly. I reckon that's right, yeah. And he won a premiership. Um, yeah, it, it, it's always seen that the UK Super League has seen, been seen as a different type of game to ours. Um, I guess that's just, I don't know, clubs just a trust factor. Sean Wayne was pitching up for a gig for Sean, a while. Oh yeah, I met Sean Wayne. He came out here and said that he was keen to come to Australia and coach. And I guess you would try them in assistant roles more than anything. Um, yeah. And so could you as, see us- as you say, there've been there've been coaches that have left here, Australians that have gone to England and coached and won a bit of silverware and then come back and coached. Holbrook. Holbrook, Nathan Brown did, Michael Maguire did, mm. and Brian Smith did. Yeah. You know, there's been a number of coaches gone across there um, and and had that journey. So could you see a situation maybe where an English coach comes here as an assistant and does a good job and then is then promoted to head coach? I can think of that. Yeah, yeah. We've, yeah. We've, we've certainly spoken about a few of those over the years when we're looking for assistant coaches. Yeah. It's just, it depends on the skill set that you want and what your head coach is looking for. Some, some look at, you know, head coaches will look at um, as assistant coaches, attacking coaches, defensive coaches and special plays coaches or transition coaches or whatever they call them. And then individual coaches like kicking and mind coaches and those sort of things. Or they might look at forwards coaches and backs coaches and outside back coaches and playmaker coaches and yeah. front row coach, middle forwards. And, you know, it's becoming more and more specialised. So yeah. the, the breakup of the skill set of your assistant coaches is becoming more and more specialised, which is why they're having more and more coaches, yeah. you know. And then you, these days you're going to have to have you, – one of the big things is – Data analytics, you know, like all the all the stats that you see on fantasy football and all that. Our coaches take no notice of those. They're not the stats that I we I can use. assure you I don't look at the fantasy <laughs> football numbers. Yeah, but anyway, uh, what, what I'm saying is what, what people see as traditional stats and how they rate players and all that sort of thing is so far removed from what NRL coaches use and what they look at. We, we have to provide – our coaches spend all night – when the game is over, they spend the next 16 hours going through the tapes and getting the, the data that they want. Right, the data that they want. So, how do um, they work out what? One, data? Of, one of the things we're working on now, one of the things we're we're really considering and trying to get educated on is how we use data analytics and artificial intelligence to shorten those processes and make and what's capable in those type of things to to actually do the analytics of games, not only in talent scouting but game plans and artificial uh, intelligence in rugby league. Trust Jesus. me, baby. If you're not, if you you you're, you're off the pace if you're not talking about it. There'll be artificial intelligence for podcasts. I'm not, I'm not saying. Well, soon we won't need human beings. Computers will run the world, mate. Well, what do we do? Nothing. We haven't got a job. Hey? We won't have a job. We'll be dead and gone, mate. Don't worry about it. So you said. I'm not talking tomorrow, but in the future. In the future. Hmm. In the future. It, there will be. Data and analytics is, is a big part of the game. You said, you said that the, your coaches, look th- they spend that time looking through the tapes and pulling out the data they want. Yep. How does a coach work out what data is important? To what he sees is important for the team. So that's the, that's, that's he, yeah. your, that is your personal, um, that's the personal element or the personal they'll coaching all, skill is that they've got to find out what's they'll important. They'll all be, I, I heard, I heard, a, I heard, I don't know whether it's true. I don't know whether it's true, but back in the day. Well, when I was coaching, like when I was coaching, we, we only had videos. We didn't have computers and data and all that sort of thing. I would go through the tape two or three times. I would ask, my first thing was me and my mate would sit down and we'd write down the game. And when I say we'd write the game, right? Opposition kicks off, seven catches the ball, passes to eight. Nine goes to dummy half, passes to 10. Nine goes to dummy half, passes to 11. Really? Nine goes to dummy half, passes to seven, passes to six, kick. And we would write down the game. That would have taken forever. Well, that's what coaching was. That's why I don't sleep. We would go down and write down, and then we'd go back defensively, tackles. And talk about tackles. Well, Blake might make 40 tackles, but he might be the fourth man in 15 of those times. He might, you know, like – and what what our our stats providers say are missed tackles or ineffective tackles or missed, you know, all these sort of what they give points for a tackle – and nothing like what the coaches look at. You know, we don't we don't look at tackle counts and missed tackles. We don't look at runs and run meters. We look at how it fits into the system and what it does. And we look at what's happening off the ball. You know, and, and other things that the players are doing. And um, you know, when every, on every play in attack and defence, you've got a job, and the coaches want to hold you up to the mark with that job, even though you don't get the ball, even though you're not involved in the defence, even though as it's just being in position, your movement off the ball. And how you're going, and they're getting they're getting those data analytics, and 
and they'll have a number of measures during the course of a game that they believe in that if we do enough of this over a period of time, the game will come to us and we'll, we'll get our opportunity. So if I'm going to be a you know, simple thing, support play and that sort of thing, I could, I could support 20 times and never get the ball. But what I have done, I've stopped them from having four-man tackles and slowing the play of the ball because they've had to accommodate for me. Yep. I have had to make their defence move and move up and then have to go back again, so it's a wear and tear. And But then one day I will get the ball and people will notice them, but they didn't notice the other 20 times. That's a very, very simple example of it. Yep. Right? It's a, a very... But it's those sort of actions that you're talking about, putting pressure on kickers and chasing kicks and, you know, GPS now. And, you know, when, when they kick downfield and the kick chase, they can measure whether how what, what part of your top speed, what percentage of your top speed are you in the kick chase. So looking at effort levels and looking at, you know, so when you hear coaches about talk about front-loading front loading their effort levels or their effort levels or their effort parts of the game – they're things that are so far removed from tackle counts and run counts and run metres and all that. Coaches don't look at that stuff. Mm. And, and it's a poor education for the players to think that that's what makes a good player because it doesn't necessarily do that. And it doesn't necessarily equate to winning. So the mindset around coaches and what they look for in a game, they've actually got to go back and, mm. and look at all this in their own way. And they'll have data analysts doing that for them, data analysts coming up vision, data analysts – Making all these stats because it's a it's a heavy workload for the coaches. If you if you're not if they're not doing eighty hours hundred hour weeks, then they're not going to compete. It'd be a fun job being a data analyst. If you're a footy head, there are plenty of people that want to do it, but you've got to have those with a passion for the game and a passion for the work ethic and the time that it takes, and also understand the game, mm. understand the game. Mm. So. Um, I remember back in 2002 when uh, sports data joined up with the NRL to perform NRL stats, they had this technology where they could time code the game into a computer. So yep. with a click of a mouse, I could find any incident in any game. If I'd have had that back in the 80s, I'd have been a scratch golfer. I would have been able to go to the driving range because the, it, the time it saved, it was the greatest coaching tool of all time. But what he said to me was, my programmers, my time coders don't know the game. They don't, what, what do we look for in a game? So we found 8,000 different events in a game to be time-coded into the game, and I gave them a generic name and a generic description of what that would look like so that all coaches and all players would understand what that meant when they were looking for what they were looking. But it's so more advanced on that. Mm. You know? So they're, they're saying to me, right, these are, they're experts. I'm not, it's not going to happen in my time, but um, you know, people that I know that are into this sort of thing are saying that eventually you'll be able to download the vision of a game into AI and it will come back with, in seconds, it will, it will understand what you want and it will provide the data for you. Now, that's, that might be years away, but with artificial intelligence, which keeps educating itself over and over with things, there's no sort of limit on to – don't ask me to explain oh, mate, it. I, it. You start to talk it, about AI. It I starts just, to spin mate, my mind. My, my eyes start spinning. Now, Origin. Origin, baby. Billy and Madge both spoke yesterday. I'll start with Billy. Here's a little grab about um, some of the issues he's confronting. One of them, not positive. No Tino, no Gilbert, and no Cohen Hess as options in the forwards. But he does have this conundrum, which I'm sure all coaches would love to face, of trying to somehow fit Grant, Hunt, Ponga, Walsh, and Munster into the same Queensland team. You know, that decision comes in six weeks' time. You know, there's still six games to go in the NRL before we sit down and um, assess everyone's habits, everyone's actions in their game and, um, and work out what is best suited for Queensland. Um, but that's a possibility. I'm, I'm not one to just sit and, um, and go with what has worked in the past or, or what everyone else has done. Um, I'm willing to look outside the box and and see what suits our team. Um, but it's got to suit our team. You've got to be realistic with it, and uh, we'll make that decision in six weeks' time. All right. That's quite <laughs> that's quite the enjoyable conundrum, isn't it? So let's say Ben he's, Hunt's... He's st- sounding more and more like a coach, Billy, every day. He's very good at drawing that line between being a commentator, and then when you ask him a question in his role as a commentator yeah, that switches, relates to his coaching job, he just bang. He switches over to coach. Yeah. yeah. Jeffrey Boycott. Um. If Ben Hunt starts at hooker like they have and Harry Grant comes off the bench and Reese Walsh is the fullback and Munts is the 5'8", my question to you, how, how would, they, would, they, would they carry a hooker and Ponger on the same bench? Yeah, look, 
this is the beauty of coaching origin, right? And that's the one thing I've said. There's no such thing. There's no salary cap mm. and your roster is unlimited, all right? So when a good player gets hurt, a good player comes in. You can never pick a bad side is what I'm saying, all right? There have been a handful of players over the years that if they were missing, it does affect the origin team, right? And, and you're talking about the greats, the elite of the elite, all right? So if you haven't got a Cameron Munster or you haven't got a Jonathan Thurston or you haven't got a Andrew Johns or you haven't, you know, a Darren Lockyer, like a Brad Fittler, like mm. there, there are those elite. They're the very elite of the elite. But for 95% of them, they're replaceable. They're replaceable with another player of equal ability that's going to do the job, you know. Um, and the quality of your team is often shown by the quality of player who misses because sometimes you've got two great players, three great players in a certain position or can play a certain role, um, you know, and there's no doubt that Queensland have been masters at being able to accommodate, you know, two playmaking hookers and a playmaker that plays half or five, eight or fullback at club level and playing them as a lock forward during the course of the game. It gives them in, instant interchangeability during the course of a game. It gives the coach great options. You know, you, the players you mentioned there are all outstanding origin players. <laughs> They're blessed. Yeah, but, you know, uh, again, as to what do they keep persevering with Ben Hunt uh, at the representative level, given the younger talent and everyone that's coming through? Um, Harry Grant's now had a few years there. Obviously, Ben Hunt's experience has been wonderful for them. They don't play him in a halves role. They only play him in a hooker role off the bench. He could play lock, though, couldn't he? He could, but you know they've used Caelan Ponga there. Now, it's Caelan Ponga in the forms he's in. You you couldn't have ever imagined picking 17 players for Queensland and Caelan Ponga not being there somewhere. And it's not like it's not like you know where players get a, a, a bit of a connotation about being a bench player or a starter. In Origin, you're all part of the mix. You've all got a role, and you might be, you know, all all my bench players. I would say were 80 minute players. They might have to go in in the second minute of the game and, and play in a role. And you've got to have all positions and permutations covered. Poor old New South Wales last year, after one minute, Trebojevic gets hurt and Damian Cook ends up in the centres. That's the sort of thing you've got to avoid. You can't have that, all right? Because that was just, that, that affected everything about them in a vital game. So with Billy Slater there, A, it's a wonderful problem to have. B, he can't pick a bad team, doesn't matter what he does. Um, and C, it's a matter of, time and place and, as you say, who's playing the best football at the time and, and how it all meshes together, how he sees the game being played. First game's in Sydney, all right? How does he see that game playing? What's the surface going to be like? What the conditions going to be like? What will New South Wales throw up? Uh, we've still got Melbourne and we've still got Brisbane up our sleeve, you know. Um, how will I play our game? First game is usually tight. It's a lot of, you know, transition football. It's a lot of kick reception and kick chase. Uh, who who best serves that <clears throat> and go with that combination and it might be different for Melbourne, it might be a little bit different for Brisbane. Y you can do that when you've got the luxury of talent level in those key positions. I'm trying to work out what you're saying about fitting two hookers and ponger in the same 17. Well, I don't think you will. You can't? No. I no. think Harry Grant's nearly at the position where he's an 80-minute player. I think if Ben Hunt's on the bench, he's only covering one position, you know, um, and they can cover the other positions with other players. I, I can't imagine picking a Queensland team without Caelan Ponger in it. Mm. Or, I find or, it so hard in, to imagine in, they in won't the pick seven, Ben Hunt. In the 17. Well, yeah, but Ben Hunt's, you know, Ben Hunt's been a long servant, a great servant of the game, and they probably will pick him, mm. you know, but that's going to mean a Reese Walsh or a Caelan Ponger or a, a someone's going to miss out, doesn't it? No, well, that was my question. If there's a, if there's a world in which they could accommodate both, but, but let me say this, let me say this because you're, you're wasting our time and you're wasting the listeners' time here. No, I'm not. Yes, I love it because I'm, are, I'm getting excited already because we're six weeks away. Yeah, there's someone's never too, get too early to, too early to talk. Oh, you've been saying this for get years. Hurt. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get suspended. Never right? too early to talk. Someone's going to get food poisoning. <laughs> food <too> poisoning. <laughs> Don't pick your team. But that's just in the Queensland camp. Yeah, don't pick your team until the Met. Oh, they're going to get. They're going to fall off a horse or do something. <laughs> do you know what's funny? Murray told me before we walked in here. Didn't, so the New South Wales camp's going to Lura this year. So I've heard. Do you know the last time they were in the mountains, the New yeah. South Wales, they fell off the horse. They, they went, haven't been there since. They went horse riding and <laughs> singing around the campfire. <laughs> they haven't been there since. They lost a do you reckon they'll be horse riding? I don't think that'll be happening. Yeah, but what caused that? 
Couldn't oh. buy out. Wayne Pierce wanted to do less drinking, more togetherness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they turned they yeah. turned into jockeys and fell off. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Saw well, the vision I'm, yesterday, I'm, Robbie. I'm, t- I'm telling you, baby, we got the best of it. Robbie Kearns and our, Bradley our, Clyde turned up at the hospital. Our era was oh. our era was the best of it. Like no media, no mobile phones. No, our era was. I unashamedly say that our era was the best of it. I, the scrutiny, the media scrutiny, and what's what it's done to rugby league over the years is just incredible in all those little ways. They reckon Junior used to, Junior Pierce used to get his guitar out and, and play. Oh, and yeah. sing well, himself. Sing, he, sing, yeah. he sings in a rock band. <laughs> oh, no. he, he thinks he's Midnight Oil. <laughs> Could you imagine Gus, <laughs> imagine a, Gus sitting around with his who's acoustic the, Who's singing? the singer at Midnight Oil? Peter Garrett. Uh, Peter, he thinks he's Peter Garrett. <laughs> Just think I shared a flight with Peter Garrett once. Did you? Yeah, we were sitting in business class. He sat next to me. He Did he have tall, a clue who he was? Tall man. Yeah? yeah, he knew. He knew the footy. He knew the, I knew who he was. Mm. Footy. I'm just thinking about why I was on a plane the other day. I sp- sat next to Mark Boris. Well, he knows who you are. Yeah. He's a sponsor. I sat next to um, who was the bloke from the castle? Uh, Michael Caton. I sat next to Michael Caton on a flight. Oh, yeah. that would have been cool. Yeah. Did you talk? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Love the footy. Is he a New South Horseman? Is he? I oh, think he's a Victorian. I don't, I don't know. Victorian. I don't know. Oh, well, wait, who else? Who's the other famous people you've sat with on planes? No, I can go back and think of it. What, what about it? Snoop Dogg and Rabs? Rabs sitting with Snoop Dogg. <laughs> <laughs> Snoop Dogg. Oh, Snoop Dogg God. spelt. He spelt Ray's Chardonnay on his lap <laughs> when he put his seat back. Could you think of any two people more less suited to each other? He, he had no idea. He had no idea <laughs> no, who the Snoop the dog Dogg was. was no. The only dogs he knows. And are when he went to go crook, the Snoop Dogg bigger. <laughs> <laughs> his big guard dogs come out. The Snoop Dogg didn't even move. <laughs> Didn't even acknowledge Ray. The big guard dogs come and got Ray. Oh, God. Who's the Snoop Dogg? Mm. Um, I'll tell you what. The famous people you've sat with on a plane, send it through here. We'll give you a mention next week. Um, <sighs> seen some famous people asleep at airports. <laughs> Don't mention the war. I was going to play the Michael Maguire grab, but we're running out of time. Go on, play it. Okay, play it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll keep that obviously to myself and the players. Um, but every coach, you know, I guess it's a little bit of a reset for, for where we're at. You know, when you when you bring someone new in, that we get to make up a bit of change, and, and I'll definitely bring that. Um, you know, I found with the playing group, you know how uh, how special this space is, and how passionate they are. Uh, you know, and how we need to come together. Yes. Yeah, so my question: new coach, new direction, opportunity to change things up. They've lost the last two series, so it would be remiss of them not to make some sort of change. How far do you think he might go? Well, this is really interesting for me because if you look at the history of um, of origin coaching, you know, particularly in the last probably 30 years, I suppose, um, a lot of the origin coaches, and it's happened with Queensland too, have been ex-origin players. Yeah. And all come out of similar teams. So you um, uh, fellas that I coached in origin back in the 90s and early 2000s, your Ricky Stewart's and Brad Fittler's and Laurie Daly's and those sort of blokes have put their hand up to coach origin. And it's kind of been a bit of a continuation, you know, they put their own stamp on it, but it's been a bit of continuation of that sort of meld. And Queensland have been doing that for 40 years. I mean, that's doesn't matter who coaches them, all the others are around them and still cheering for them, you know. Um, Michael Maguire, even though he played at the Canberra Raiders, and I think he coached, he would have been playing with a lot of those rep players back then. He, did, he wasn't in the origin framework. He didn't play origin football. So it's kind of like a new, fr- a fresh set of eyes over everything. Mm. So he's... Um, he's going to do it his way. Hence, I suppose, why they're going to Lura and not going to Coogee because that's where Coogee, that's where the origin camps were. But um, he'll have his own slant on all of that. He'll have his own analytics in how he's going to pick the team um, and he'll do it his way. What he has done, though, he has coached representative level with the New Zealand team and yes. qu- quite successfully. So he, he understands the dynamics of bringing people together from different clubs in a short space of time to fight for a common cause, which is what the origin coach has to do. And it's short term coaching in representative football is is unique and it's it's different to your club coaching. It's kind of what you do over three or four years as a club coach, you're condensing into six days for game one and that's your practice round for game two, which is your practice round for game three and hopefully you improve the, the longer the series goes. So having had, you know, Brad Fittler, Laurie Daly, Ricky Stewart, um, myself um, before me, might have been. Um, I think Graham Murray had a couple of stint, had a stint, short stint there. I think Tommy O'Donnell had a short stint there, and then it was sort of 
Tim of, Sheens, Wayne Pearce. Yeah, back to me, then Tim Sheens and uh, Wayne Pearce had a short stint there. Wayne was an ex-Origin player. So this is kind of, um, uh, for the first time in probably over a decade, that probably since Graham Murray coached the side, that it's not one of the former players that have been in that inner sanctum before. Um, so it's a fresh set of eyes over the whole program, which could be timely. It could be exactly what New South Wales needs. Right. Well, at least we hope so. We're all supporting it. You know, Freddie made 11 changes when he took over in 2018. Can you say something similar to that? Oh, I think it'll be rather unique, the team he picks. You I do? Think, I, I think there'll be a lot of surprises. Yeah, right. Yeah. What makes you think that? Because I know. I, I know. Right. I, I, I think I know where where he will go to for his uh, support on that and what they'll do, and I think it'll be quite analytically and quite data-based. Yeah. And I'll be very, very surprised because I you. because I know. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think I think it'll be a great. I'm nowhere near it. I got nothing to do with it. But yeah, I, I know who's, I know who he leans on for this sort of stuff. And I think that it will be very, very different. I, I think there'll be quite a few shocks. Yeah, right. Yeah, quite a few shocks. I think it'll be. Yeah, it'll be. I, I don't think he'll be afraid. Think outside the box and. Does it need that at this stage, after what's happened last year? Haven't won. No, I haven't won. So he's there to change it up. Yeah. Like I said, it's a fresh set of eyes. It's kind of like, you know, uh, Laurie, Ricky, Fit, Brad Fitler. They all played together mm. in Origin. They all sort of have their their thoughts about Origin and what it should look like. And they have you. Here's someone that's coming in with a fresh set of eyes and saying, "Okay, I've coached a Premiership winning team. I've coached a team that's beaten Australia with New Zealand. Um, you know, I've coached at the Melbourne Storm, and I've been my own coach. I've coached at South Sydney." Yep. Um, <clears throat> he'll have his own opinions and he'll have his own advisors and he'll have his own thoughts on how that should be played. But um, I reckon it's really interesting that that appointment. It's as you say, it's it's normally a former player. Now Queensland, I'm I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. I reckon they've only had one coach that hasn't played Origin. That'd be Graham Lowe. Graham Lowe, coach for a short term. Most of them have been ex footballers and ex Origin yeah. players. And uh, yeah, Gra- Graham Lowe would have been the only one. Mm-hmm. Let's look around seven, shall we? Big game this. Allianz tomorrow night, live and free. Here on nine from 7.30, Roosters Storm. Now, we know Teddy's back, so Manu back to the centres. Um, there's still no Sam Walker, although he is on the extended bench. And as Gus says, if they're on the extended bench, they're generally in. Big Nelson's going to play his first game of the year. Uh, Karma can meet the sideline with a calf. But uh, two teams that have had a long and storied rivalry. Allianz Thursday night footy. Yeah, well, two of the big heavyweights from the last 20 years. You know, the outstanding records, outstanding rivalry, both coming off wins. Uh, I think both will put a premium on this two points to keep that momentum going. Nelson Asopa Solomona has his first game back for the club. and I think they've been missing him up front to some extent. Um, well, the betting suggests it. It's, it's even money each of two. Um, I'm going to favour Rooster slightly, but for no reason. I, I, I don't know. I don't know, but I'll favour Rooster slightly. All right, Melbourne kicked out to that lead against the Dogs last week and Canterbury unlucky not to run them down at the end, so we'll see what happens. They're in front. Oh, of course you were too, yeah. In the shadows of the post. Mm. Thank you, the early crow. Friday, early game. Dragons Warriors. Hmm. This is interesting. Now, um, this game's at Wind Stadium, Wollongong. Now, <laughs> can you believe it? All the Lomax, Lomax, Lomax wants to play in the centre stuff. He's going to the centres because Jack Bird's out. So, Tui Pilotu is on the wing, and they've signed New Brown. Fair think New Brown's had a few clubs. More clubs than Tiger Woods. <laughs> He's back for another one. And, uh, and the Warriors, after that stunning game last week, have the job of backing up here, um, and Jester Vunga's out. Adam Pompey comes into the seventeen mm. in Wollongong. Yeah, it can be a bit of a, you know, can be quite shifty down there. Um, it's not an easy place. What to the go. people or the surface? No, the the, the <laughs> well, the winds. You know, the yes. wind sock will be blowing one way one minute, and the, mm. one, the, the other way the you can get a southerly in the first half and a northerly in the second half, or the other way around. It's uh, you know, I think dragons tend to save their best. The Wollongong, um, yeah, they'll be hard to beat down there, the Dragon. I've been consistently tipping them and getting a couple of results out of them, but I'm a real Warrior fan. Uh, again, 
I think this is far more even than the betting is suggesting. I will go with Warrior, but no real confidence. All right, potentially a close one there. Friday night up in Darwin. Parramatta have been going there for over 10 years now, and they take the Dolphins on the trip uh, up to the top end. Blaze Talungi has been recalled on the interchange bench. Mike Acevo still out of the team. Gee, they lost the hammer, the Dolphins. Young Trey Fuller, who is a regular for the Redcliffe team in the Queensland Cup, will play his second NRL game and a couple of other changes on the bench. But, gee, no hammer, not easy. Yeah, we tipped the Eel last week to cause the upset over the Cowboy, and they did it. They did it in style. They took them a few weeks to get over the Mitchell Moses um, reliance, and not that they were clinical, but they certainly, in effort areas, they were too good. Uh, Darwin's a difficult place to play. Very steamy, very slippery. You know, the quality of games up there haven't been that great. Um, and Eels have had mixed results. But I think with those players missing for the Dolphin, I will tip the Eel. Okay. Now, I think I'm right in saying I've seen a little bit of content on social media this week that Nathan Cleary and Mary Fowler have been reunited. I think Mary might be having a break um, over here. Do you see Bathurst as a romantic destination, Gus? Bathurst? Yeah. Lots of romance. You could take it for a spin around Mount Panorama. Bathurst is a romantic destination. Let me just noodle with that for a moment. You could go to the Bathurst Trots. <laughs> Bathurst Trots. <laughs> what, else, what, what else could you do? I bought uh, – my kids wanted the dog ones, yeah. right? My daughter was young, and she went onto this website called Country Puppies. Oh, and, yeah. um And this country puppy was $700. Mm-hmm. So I rung this bloke. I said, mate, where what are you? He said, where are you? He said, Orange. I said, oh, can I meet you halfway? He said, where do you want to meet? I said, Bathurst. And he said, right now. So I arranged to meet. I didn't tell the family I was going to buy this dog. Yeah. Right? So I went and took the cash out of the bank, and I've driven to Bathurst in the afternoon, yeah. all the way from the Sutherland Shire, to pick up this poodle. Yeah. And he's coming in from Orange. Right? Yeah. And I got there just on sunset. Yeah. And I parked in. I said, the only place I know in Bathurst is Carrington Park. I yeah. know the football ground. So. Yeah, yeah, I know where that is, mate. You know, real country bloke. So he breeds these dogs. Yeah. So we pulled up, and I'm waiting for this bloke, and he's pulled up, and he's got out, and he's got this little poodle in, <laughs> oh, his, no, hand, so in, in his hand like that. And he's dressed in a singlet and a pair of shorts and a pair of thongs, right? <laughs> and I'm dressed in a T-shirt, because I've just come from sea. I'm T-shirt and shorts and, and joggers, you know. And I've gone across to meet him. And he's like, ah, oh, you're the football bloke, he said. And he starts to have a bit of a chat and he's yeah. talking about the team he found and his football and that sort of thing. Well, in the meanwhile, the temperature's going from 21 degrees, it's gone down to 18 degrees, it's gone down to 13 degrees. It's now How about, long was he talking to you for? It's now about six. <laughs> and he had me there for an hour. <laughs> and I've got ice forming on and he's there in a T-shirt and thongs and he's not missing a beat. And he talked football, he talked this, and he said, here's your hound. He said, now you've got to feed it this and you've got to feed it. And I'm absolutely <laughs> frozen. And I got back in the car, and honestly, I I was crook for a week. This black from me. so I drove all the way back to Sydney, right? And this is the big surprise for the family. And I go in the house with this little pooch, you know, and and my daughter comes out and pats it once and never patted it again. That's it. That's it. That's not the one you got now, is it? No, no. Oh, he, that's he, the previous he, one. He passed away. So, is, so are you saying this? He was is a great it? little dog. He lasted fifteen years. He yeah, passed no, away a couple very, of years very ago. sad. Yeah. So are you saying this? You advising Mary to take a jacket? Is that what you're take saying? Take a jacket. Yeah. Doesn't matter what the weather says. Take a jacket. When take you go to take a big, take <laughs> a big, big <laughs> Chelsea, a uh, big overcoat. Well, they had a monsoon there last year, and West Tigers beat them. They did. They beat them in a monsoon. They did. Yeah, it gets very, very cold up there when the sun goes down. This bloke kept me, and he he didn't flinch. He's in a singlet, shorts, and a pair of thongs, a pair of stubbies, and a pair of thongs, hmm. and he's standing there with this. And was this a little fluff ball, this little moodle or whatever they call it? And he, he, he worked, you know, you're the football bloke. Mm. Said, yeah, and he started talking football. Jeez, he must have been talking to you for a while. If it's 18 degrees down to what about, about five. What about, the temperature just went like that. <laughs> I, felt, I had ice on my eyebrows. I was just <laughs> free. I'm saying, well, this bloke, shut up. Just give me this dog. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway if, look, if you, are, if you go to the game, yeah. if you see Mary Fowler, if, if you can get a selfie with Mary Fowler, send it in. Is he playing? No, he's not playing. He's but not- he'll be going to watch. Um, so Schneider's still half back, Lou Isaac. But it's a lovely area, Bathurst. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, Lockie Galvin's back for the Tigers. Yes. They couldn't ambush him again, could they? They could. I don't think they will, but they they could. They they're, they're like that. The Tigers are a much different team when they're underdogs mm. to when they're favourites. You know, they just they'd have been disappointed in what happened to them last week. 
they've got points in them and you know but I think the fact that they beat Panther there last year I think Panthers will be ready for this one and I, I, I think they'll get the money there so if you're going to take Mary on a, a date in Bathurst what would you do go to the footy then we'll, after the footy you'd get go and have a couple of beers at the local one of the local pubs yeah where would you have dinner I'd be driving straight back to Panthers, mate. <laughs> 5.30, Titans versus uh, Manly. Desi versus his old club, of course. This one is on the Gold Coast. Um, Jaden Campbell and Nienjic. He gets hurt a lot, doesn't he? Poor kid. Yeah. Phil Sammy's gone back to fullback. Brimson stays in the halves. Fafita's in the starting team. Uh, Matt Lodge, named to start in his first game back from an ACL. Ruben Garrick returns. And uh, Nathan Brown returning after missing last week. And Jason Saab is back as well. So they're... they're They've been doing well, and they've got additional reinforcements, this Manly team. Yeah, Manly, that'll be too good for Titan. This is a good game, this one. <clears> I'm calling this on the radio. I'm looking forward to Broncos versus Raiders. Still Dunkirk no State. Reynolds. Yeah. Still no Haas. Yeah. And they're oh, not just sad about Zach Hosking, so he might be out for the season. They're, they're waiting to see what happens. Um, but they're a tough team, Canberra, although they were tested last week at home. Yeah, they were. Um, they were brilliant the week before. And they put a big score on the Parramatta Eels, who came out and won since. Broncos, you know, still it's not their top lineup, is it? And they can stub their toe at different times. They're just so classy. You've got so many points in them. Um, yeah, that's that's a hard one. Mm. I, yeah, that's a hard one. I'm going to go Bronco. Bronco. With what level of confidence? What's happened? I'm getting lots of text messages. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two o'clock Sunday at Core Stadium. Bulldogs versus Knights. Connor Tracy stays at fullback. Blake Tafts comes to the bench. And an unchanged lineup for Newcastle. Gus, I hate to do this to you, but better the week, Bulldog. And Sharks versus Cowboys. Points bet stadium. Don't look at me like that. We're calling this. Um, Cronulla have it. Uh, Katoa was out, so Sam Stone Street. They say he's a he's a try scoring whiz in the lower grades. Is that right? He's a flyer. Yeah, yep, he is a flyer. And Braden Hammond Newelli plays his first. We game used to have here. a Stone Street decades ago, wasn't there? A Kenny Stone Street used to play well before my time. Roosters or somewhere. And Murray Talangi is out. Semi Valame um, comes in. Hundredth game for Scott Drinkwater for North Queensland. I, this is a. I, I I don't trust North Queensland, particularly down in the Shire. Well, I want to see them, you know, consistently win away from home before I'd tip them at the Bermuda Triangle. But the Bermuda Triangle, it doesn't – sometimes it gets into the home team's head. I don't know. I, I'm, it's easier to tip Shark and feel comfortable with that, but I kind of don't. Every time I say Shark, there's a little man inside my head saying, watch out. I'd love to have a conversation with that little man. Little man inside my head? Yep. Yeah, he's a strange dude. Whoa! Breaking news. Penrith Panthers have released James Fisher-Harris from the final two years of his contract. He'll join the Warriors from 2025. Told you I was getting lots of text messages. Holy crrr. Holy hell. That's, uh, that's a big yarn. Is that official? It's just come through. Wow. James Fisher-Harris to lead the Panthers after the year. Whew. That is a story. Mm. Uh, all right. Be more, more of that throughout uh, the week, of course, to discuss. See you tipping to wrap us up here. Uh, so I've got to go back to the start. I'm going back right to the start. So I'm going, so, to, I'm going to tip Rooster with no confidence. I'm going to tip Warrior, but that's a danger game. I'm going to tip Eel up in Darwin. I'm going to tip Panther to beat West Tiger. I'm going to tip Seagull to beat Titan, Bronco to beat Raider. And I'm going to tip Shark to beat Cowboy. See you on Sunday in the Bermuda Triangle if we arrive in one piece. Good afternoon. Have a uh, great week. Enjoy the footy. We'll be back for more Six Tackles next week. This year, NRL on 9 is your one-stop shop for all footy. That's right, Freddie. Not about the highlights. Action. Seven days a week. Billy and Gus podcast. Get that on your drive on the way home. Immortal behaviour. Grab a seat on the couch for that. And, of course, my favourite, Freddie and the Ain. The best footy brains, the biggest games. Don't trust the algorithm. Subscribe to NRL on 9 and get all your entertainment there.